Yeah, it's a Frontier video. What's up lads, you know me, I'm Sarah. If I don't mention Frontier once a month I explode like Keanu Reeves in speed, so here we are, and that's what we're doing today. Monster Hunter Frontier was live for around 12 years, and its roster of both original and returning monsters was expansive. All manner of fights, some great, some not so much made an appearance, and there was something in there for everyone. Now, whilst a lot of focus is on the unique monsters and fights, I want to take a look at the other end of the spectrum here. You see, as a game that had its roots from Monster Hunter DOS and even Freedom 2, there came an issue down the line. What do you do when you want to introduce later monsters like Seregio Sozanoga that launched later and are returning from smoother games? How do they translate to an arguably archaic engine? Simple. A bunch of new moves, huge HP buff, and stack them with enough power to turn France into some pebbles in the ocean. Oh, and make sure they're the new endgame grind too. These were the exotic species. Exotic species were introduced as part of the 8th G update in July 2015, with the first of these members being a solid third gen representation in Zenoga and Devil Joe. Now at the time there are a multitude of different challenges a Mesoport and Hunter could take on to increase their power and test their skills, not limited to, but including Burst Species, Origin Species, and even the dreaded Conquest Wars. Clearly there was a lot of competition, so where did these new arrivals sit? Well, as a matter of fact, right on top of the mountain. We're going to be covering the gear first, and then I'll endeavour to cover each fight as they come to sort of give you an idea of where the game sat at this time, and exactly the impact these new migrant monsters had. Let's start with the weapons then. To no one's surprise, they were incredibly competitive. They boasted amazing elemental power for all that qualified, and even the powerful combination elements made an appearance, such as darkness and light for Gore and Shigari Magala respectively. Yeah, trust me, those really were the names of the elements. I know. The Raw was on level with some select elite Origin Species weapons, and of course all had access to the fabled Cyan Sharpness, which was a whole step above Purple Sharpness that we know and love. Not only that, but the exotic weapons brought in the new feature of Combination Slots. You see, whilst Frontier had the traditional 1, 2 or 3 slots for your usual decorations, it also combined them with Triangular Slots for Weapon Sigils. Now we're not going to be going into that system too much, but essentially imagine multiple ramp ups from Monster Hunter Rise on a single decoration slot. More often than not, if you stack three of them, they could grant a boost of up to 45 true raw. This flexibility gave hunters a nice little boost to the options available, which was a bit of a small change, but a welcome one for sure. Very tame stuff to start with, however, because it all kicks into high gear when we explore the concept of innate skills. When you made a piece of exotic armor and put it on, Depending on the species of monster that it came from, you get an entire skill for free on top of the points that already exist on that armor piece. Let's use an example. One piece of Nagakuga armor would grant you Evasion 2, as well as 5 points towards 4 or 5 different skills. You're sort of starting to see how this all snowballed a bit. If you mixed up a few different pieces from a few different exotics, you would really start to pad out those sets, with little cost. The impact of this system was actually fairly substantial, in that there was a skill cap in Frontier. It sounds kind of insane to say, but Hunters were limited to only 12 active skills on any set before the Zenith update. The innate skills granted by Exotic Armor didn't count towards this number, essentially giving up to a 5 skill advantage over the current meta sets. This was massive. Consider as well that a lot of Exotic sets held points in skills like Strong Attack and Stylish Assault, very desirable skills. They were certainly a hot target at the time they dropped. With that in mind, we're not really going to dwell too much further on the gear. For the simple reason that in the next update, there were different g rank versions of Raviente that were introduced and the subsequent weapons that came with it completely eclipsed anything we'd seen so far. Basically it rendered exotics a little bit moot on the weapon front, which is a shame, but I would like to touch on another system called Finesse. Your standard g rank weapons in Frontier were upgraded a bit at a time, from level 1 through to level 50. When the exotics first dropped, specific max G weapons could be upgraded a step further past this 50 cap by finessing, or roughly translated mastery of the weapon. This would offer further benefits like a new sharpness level, 20-30% buffs to element and even a sizeable raw increase. The trouble with this is that the only way to do so took a specific material that only dropped from the quest reward screen and anywhere beyond 50 of these would be required for significant changes. So as you can imagine, this was a hell of a grind. 
It is to be expected though, really in Frontier, as the game inched ever closer to the Z update, unfortunately these weapons began to fall further and further off. Still, the main reason I wanted to make this video and the part I think you're all looking for is the fights. What actually happened to each exotic in turn to Frontierify them? Was it any good? Let's start with the quests themselves. Now, these were billed at the higher end of G-rank quests, around the 7 to 8 star mark, which comes as no real surprise. Thing is, the star system in Frontier actually had an effect on gameplay. For every star that the quest level had, a flat amount of defense was taken away from the hunter at the outset. Of course, this had a huge impact on the power difference that you'd feel between quests, but hunters did also have the option to reduce this level. The lower the star level, the less rewards you got, but the easier you could take a punch to the mouth. It's actually kind of a nice example of offering an easy way in for less familiar players, giving them an option of more loot for backbreakingly hard quests, or more of a grind that cared about you a bit more than a firing squad would. Yeah, about that though. The exotics were locked at 8 star. No reduction for you at all, you had to be ready if you were going to take these suckers on. It's fairly appropriate since at their introduction they were only accessible if you'd obtained a G ranking of 500, so one would expect a dedicated player to be adequately prepared for this. Still, not to downplay it, they were very tough. You also have to consider that back then when some of these released, there was no extreme style available for a lot of these fights, and your movement options and protection was very limited for a lot of weapons too. But that's about setting up the stage for all of the monsters here, I'm about ready to cover them. Who's with me? The first new arrival, as mentioned, was Zenoga. Zenoga's fairly blessed for being quite an advanced monster for its time when it released in Portable 3rd, and it strikes a good balance between old engine and new hunting styles, so it was a bit of a no-brainer when it came to its inclusion in Frontier. You'd see your typical Paw Slams, summoning Thunderbugs and what have you, but the stars were the following attacks. The Blanca Ball. Zenoga would do its stationary taunt to get you to lower your guard and then bounce like Rajang with a quick slam AoE. I think it's a very nice touch using the monster's idle animation to throw even experienced players off. We'd actually see something like this return with unknown Black Flying Wyvern. Next was a new Paw Slam combo ender that Zin was given from the 3 Slam combo. Its sole purpose was to completely throw you off any guard or evasion greed and sort of roll catch you when you thought you were safe. Another attack that could replace this was the Uppercut Slam. Instead of finishing off this combo, Zin would send you flying into the air before coming back down with a follow up slam. Both of these were fairly prevalent threats, and you had to be on guard for these very common attacks at all times. Finally, there was the damage check. At three different percentages of health, Zenoga would spin around and scatter a large area of Folgabugs before detonating the lot. If you get caught in this column, you are done. It is a true one shot. It goes through any protection, any defense, any sort of gut skill. You get a feel for the timing when it was going to come out with consistent damage, but it would really punish you if you didn't get the hell out of there as quickly as you could. Zenoga's innate skill for its armor was Thunder Attack 2. Next came Devil Joe. Your typical fight from 3U, with increased speed, range, and power, this will be a fairly standard trope you'll see with the exotics. The main offenders here were a new stomp into spin attack that resulted in a pin. And for those of you who remember, a pin from Joe in 3rd gen pretty much meant death without a pocket full of feces. The most iconic attack, however, was this huge rock slab. Much like Zenoga, or the entirety of Elden Ring, Joe would hold this attack for the rest of time before letting it go. Still, it looked badass and even if it caught you when you weren't expecting it to, it was definitely an unforgettable moment. Devil Joe's innate skill was called Starving Wolf. It was essentially the stamina version of Adrenaline. When your stamina bar was at the utmost minimum and glowing red, you received a huge buff to your affinity rate and critical modifier, as well as evasion plus two. This wasn't as bad as it seemed, since a lot of weapons had ways to activate iframes without using stamina, like Tonfa or Switch Axe, so it would see a bit of use here and there. Our third and final member of the G8 update was Brachydeus. Everyone's favorite missile was all about combos in this installment. Punches would now chain into each other and into a belly slam AoE, and explosions would now come out in a cone in a group of three rather than a single line. A cool feature is that five years before its western debut, Bracky actually had the multiple punch AoE that the variant Raging took from it in 5th gen. Oh, and he could also flood an entire underground area with slime to explode. Pretty massive stuff right there. Especially with how much evading you were doing, it's kind of nice that the Blast Blight eventually became a non-issue. Bracky's innate skill was Bomber which increased bomb damage and any blast status that you had on your weapons. The G9 update was next, and with it came Baryoth and Uragan. Baryoth was 
actually just more of the same. He came with a lot more ranged to tail swings in the form of ice shards, as well as larger tornadoes, but if you'd played Tri, you'd recognise a lot of this Barriot's moves. It did have one incredibly evil juggle attack that it could do, but mostly it's sort of built off of what Sand Barrier did in Portable 3rd, jumping all over the place, getting behind you to smack you, and flying out of tornadoes to do 10 trillion damage at the speed of sound. Now it was nowhere near as crazy as some of the other entries in this list, but still an engaging fight nonetheless. Barrios' innate skill, unsurprisingly, was Ice Attack 2. And then, there's Uragan. What an utter, utter bastard. For a monster whose main attacking method was Chin Slams, Cog and all their genius decided to add a lingering explosion effect to these slams, completely blocking Hunters off. It was incredibly frustrating, but eventually was mitigated by the later introduction of Extreme Style. At best, it was a bit of a band-aid fix, and all of the backflips, extra explosions, and lingering fire pits still left a bit of a sore taste in people's mouths. The most egregious aspect, however, was this vacuum spin. Check this out. Uragan spins in the ground, rocks coming from the back, and a suction field pulling you in from the front. Now, in most situations, this would be considered a fun Friday night, but it was anything but in Mesa Porter. Complete denial, no openings, no way to knock him out of it, you can't attack. All you could do was run. What a horrible, horrible attack. In fact, the only thing really to praise this overgrown woodlouse was the damage that it actually did in real life. Dude straight up crashed the Frontier servers when it launched with this attack, forcing Capcom to roll them back to accommodate the launch. That's genuinely impressive, even if Aragorn sucks. His innate skill was guard 2 for Blade Masters, and for Gunners, it increased the combination success rate for each ammo. We move on to the G10 update now. The last before Zenith Monsters blasted in and stole the show. Two new exotics graced the stage, with the first one being Naga Kuga. Naga's an interesting one, itself being a second generation monster, but it was introduced in Freedom Unite, so it was in a bit of a limbo period where it was never completely factored in at Frontier's launch. So now, it gets grandfathered in with a bunch of new toys. First of all, huge amounts of combos, Naga now naturally doubles up on a lot of its attacks in its new blue rage mode, and gain the ability to shoot out poison spikes in large area sweeps with its tail. Very reminiscent of Lucent Naga Kuga more than anything, and you know me, anything that's even close to Lucy is good by me. The most notable moves that one would see were the teleportation jump and the dust cloud. After Naga's strafe jumps, it could now combo it into a double dash attack where it disappears for a moment. In the after images, the hunters would experience a high level of stun that ended up knocking them to their knees, at which point Naga would roar and wind would strike the ground where it had dashed. Very disorientating, as the target camera in Frontier was bare bones at best and complete dog shit at worst, you could find it very easy to get outmaneuvered very fast. And of course, the dust cloud. Three damaging spins in place, all kicking up dust clouds to obscure your vision, after which Naga would fly forward, dealing a ton of damage if you didn't get your timing down to a science. Honestly, chaining guard points for all four hits in this combo felt so, so satisfying, but it was a deadly attack if you weren't prepared to deal with it. Pretty sort of cemented Naga's swift and aggressive nature. As mentioned before, his innate skill was evasion plus two. This was a huge skill for Frontier and basically required. Finally, Stygian Zenogo reared its head. Allegedly, the team behind Frontier initially wished for this to be the first exotic species in the series. However, due to the fact that it would have been a bit weird to have a subspecies in a game with no base species, this was put on the back bench. Stygian was nutty. Dragon Tornadoes, a jet black charge state, and the previous Zenoga nuke was swapped out for a fucking orbital laser of all things. On top of that, the Stig could spin juggle hunters, which removed any iframes from being thrown back from the initial attack, much like Magna Malo. But the real impressive shit lies with the Dracophage bugs. You see, Blights from 3rd Gen started to rear their head at this point, and none was more interesting than Dragon Blight. On top of removing your element, Stygian would burn through the items in your pouch. That's right, much like Camellios, you may end up needing a Max Potion to find they're all just completely gone now. And if that wasn't enough, getting Blighted would also tank your sharpness. We're talking a whole level from purple down to white, from cyan down to purple, and so on. True to its name, Stygian Zenoga was evil. And, can you believe it? The innate skill for this armor was Dragon Attack Up 2. Shocking, I know. We're moving on now to the Z update, where exotics both excelled and suffered. You see, Zenith monsters were so obscenely powerful in terms of weapon and armor, the exotics really got pushed out. You'd occasionally see a single piece here or there on a set, but mostly, it was all about the Zs. In contrast, however, the monsters themselves got tougher. Four were introduced throughout the course of this update and came with super-powered roars and quake effects, needing additional protection past the max. They'd stolen this from the Zenith monsters to stay relevant, of course, and the first of these were the Megalas. 
Our first fourth generation entry here, Gore and Shigaru Magala started off strong. They had huge cone-shaped roars that seemed to catch you no matter what, massive balls of frenzy and very quick side tackles. The main thing about these dudes, however, is once they hit their true frenzy state. Look at the dramatic change in appearance, the huge AoEs and a particularly brutal claw slam into frenzy explosion that's a personal favourite of mine. Seriously, look how badass this attack is. Special notes, however, with regards to Shigaru, it's a rotten piece of filth. This very scientific conclusion comes from this awful attack, an insanely fast wind-up roar into a ground frenzy explosion. This shit caught me every time, I swear, every time. The innate skills for the Mogalas were status attack resistance for Shigaru and focus too strangely for Gore. The 4th gen entries were strong ones indeed, but 3rd gen still had an ace up its sleeve. Enter the Storm Napkin, Amatsu Magatsuchi. It really does seem like I'm repeating myself somewhat, but there were really only two significant changes if you went from mainline Amatsu to Frontier, otherwise it kind of stayed the same. The first was this cool little delayed slam that it did, and the second, well, it wouldn't be Frontier without some sort of AoE, would it? A huge charged water ball. Dropped slowly to cover the entire area in waves, but could easily be dodged once you got the timing down. A bit underwhelming, really, isn't it? Well, just wait till you hit phase two. Amatsu exploded with dragon energy, emerging from a tornado coloured maroon and furious. All the attacks were now a combination of dragon and water, and a lot of them augmented with huge range or increased size. Visually, it was a spectacular transformation, and one of the best indicators of a fight hitting a new gear that I've seen outside of some of the more extreme challenges in Frontier. As you'd expect, Amatsu's innate skill was water attack, plus two. And finally, the best that I've been saving till last. Seregios. Seregios was the fight I feel took the most from the Zenith monsters. The bleed status it had introduced to the series was pumped to the next level in Frontier and also shared with Zenith Tigrex. It inflicted constant damage, no matter what you did. The only cure was a single item to be thrown at the ground with no protection from follow-up procs. Put simply, Seregios said to you, just don't get hit, idiot. Alongside this were much larger scale projectiles, a piercing Zenith level roar, and then the wings. You may notice Seregios prancing around with bright red wings at certain points, and this pointed to an important game mechanic. You see, during the attacks where the wings were glowing, he would dive bomb at you. Scoring a hit on him in the middle of this animation would cancel any hurt frames headed your way, and the moment he landed, he'd pop for a short knockdown. I believe it did damage as well. This shit ruled. It was such a satisfying feeling trading with this monstrosity of a pinecone and coming out the winner. One of the best exotic fights for sure. Now, with regards to the innate skill on the armor, there's a bit of controversy here. You see, I'm sure we're all familiar with Seregios' roll to sharpen gimmick on the Blade Master weapons, and funnily enough, Frontier actually had this as a skill, called Stylish, whereby rolling through different attacks would restore your sharpness each time. Well, Seregios obviously took the initiative here, and of course, the native skill was Critical Eye 5. Honest to God, I had no idea what they were thinking. Stylish was right there, Seregios has never had crit on any of its armor sets, but I guess there you have it, a skill that perfectly covers Steve, right? Crit Eye. Anyways, Exotics were the prime example of how Frontier could take an existing fight and add their own twists to it. Despite looking crazy and a fair bit over the top sometimes, mechanically they were properly, properly decent fights, and a lot of fun. Except Aragon. Fuck Aragon. Thanks for watching everyone. Hope you enjoyed this bit of Frontier coverage. Let me know if there's anything else you'd like to see. It's been a while since I've done a Frontier video and it's always a blast to get back in the seat and do this again. As for now, thanks lads, until next time.